I'm Jen Valenga, and this is the Ditch Your Backup Plan podcast. Stories of rewarding careers between starving artist and celebrity to inspire you to follow a risky career path. To me, backup plan, I mean, backup means failure, like you feel like it's a failure, and plan means you put effort into it. So I didn't put energy into what to do if something goes wrong. Instead, I took that energy into figuring out how do I make money? Today's episode features Elizabeth Nesselrode. She's an actor living in New York City and an acting coach who recently created and launched the New to New York Theater online course. You can check out more information about that in my show notes. Liz was also a student of mine and one of the hardest working students I know. I had a really great time catching up with her. I hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get right into it. I was a little delayed editing this week, so here's my interview with Elizabeth Nesselrode. Elizabeth Nesselrode, it's so nice to have you here on the podcast. How are you? I'm good, Jen. It's so great to hear your voice. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's good to hear your voice, too. I'm so glad to have you here. So where are you calling from? I'm calling from my apartment in Manhattan, New York. And you've been there all throughout this period, or have you been back and forth? I have not gone anywhere further than Brooklyn since Christmas 2019. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing right before the shutdown? Well, I had done a Christmas show was my last acting gig, and I had just I had just made it to final callbacks for a Broadway show that ultimately didn't get to open because of the shutdown. Um, So I'd been auditioning, taking on camera class, voice lessons, and had a whole bunch of teaching gigs around the thespians conferences. Sure. I was supposed to travel down to Florida and perform with the skivvies and do some adjudicating and do a, a conference in New York as well. And, and all of it disappeared in about 48 hours, which was fascinating. With everybody. Yeah. So what do you call yourself? I know you do a lot of different things, but what do you, how do you characterize your job? I have mostly called myself an actor and teaching artist, thinking that teaching artist is when I'm working with organizations. I've also privately coached and that has become a much bigger thing now. But yeah, actor, teaching artist, coach. Talk about the skivvies a little bit. Yeah. Well, the skivvies are wonderful. And uh, at that time, it's it's a band of two folks. It's Nick Searley and Lauren Molina. And Lauren was playing Sally Bowles in Cabaret. And they had a standing gig to perform at the Florida Thespians Conference and then stick around and, and do some adjudication and teach some classes. And so I had accompanied them just in the band the previous fall for a, a fundraiser for uh a shelter, an animal shelter. Uh, Lauren, I actually know originally because she's who I got my cats from. She fosters cats. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I met her and I got these sweet kitties from her. And then I played for her in that show. And so they'd reached out to me and asked me to to sub in to be, you know, quote Lauren for the skivvies. And so we had had rehearsals and we were getting ready for all of this stuff. And my flight was the Tuesday after Broadway shut down. And, uh, and so it all just, it all just disappeared real quick. Oh my gosh. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. The timing. I mean, I found out that Broadway was shut down as I was walking into a school, one of my teaching artist gigs is for Disney. Mm. And so we do residencies. So I was in the process of directing a production of Frozen Kids. I think we were the first production of Frozen Kids as part of this program called Disney Musicals in Schools, which I'm obsessed with. I love that program. So I was at a school far, far, far away out in the boroughs. And I was walking into that school when I got a news notification that Broadway was shut down. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Um, So I went in and I ran a rehearsal. And these kids had just gotten to see Aladdin on Broadway the day before. Mm. And so I kind of shifted with my teaching partner the plan. And we were like, okay, we we don't know what's happening. We didn't know for sure. Would they get to do their show or not? You know, at that point, we didn't think it would be that long. We thought maybe we'd lose some time. Who knows? But so we had them do some self-reflection on 
what they learned from seeing Aladdin on Broadway and what they wanted to apply from that in their production. And they were like, everybody in the ensemble was like doing stuff the whole time. And they were so engaged. These are like third to fifth graders and they were so sweet. And it was so emotional to hear all of their reflections when we're like, what is going on in the world right now? And afterwards the teachers in a production meeting were like, so are we, what's happening? And we were like, we do not know, but Disney will tell us and we will find out. And I was supposed to still go see an off-Broadway show that night that at that point was still happening. And then a few hours later, that was also canceled. It was oh. a very surreal weekend. And then worrying about your own health and safety at the same time, right? Right. I mean, I was that school is about an hour and a half away from me. And so I had been taking the subway there and back. And at that time, you know, nobody was encouraging us to wear masks yet. They were saying, save them for the health professionals. And so I wasn't wearing masks. And every day there were more and more people wearing masks on the subway. So it was a little scary. Also, my mother, I, I grew up in Seattle. And so it had hit there a lot sooner. So my mother had been in a, a shutdown situation already. She's a choir director and, and works for churches. So she had like called off all choir things and all church things for weeks. And I definitely was skeptical. I didn't totally, <laughs> I didn't totally buy in, but mother's always right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, mom, what are you doing? And then yeah. you're like, oh no. Never mind. You're right. Yeah, exactly. But have you remained safe? Oh yeah. I mean, I don't go much of anywhere. Mm -hmm. So you said Seattle. Well, I want to know, should we talk a little bit about the Disney program? Sure. Yeah. It's an amazing program. It's part of uh, the education department in New York's Disney theatrical group, which is, it's a small branch within Walt Disney Studios. And it's smaller now because of everything that's happened. They've cut the department down in size significantly. Are you still working for them? Well, technically I'm furloughed uh, because I am a part-time employee. They don't, I don't get benefits or anything through them. So it doesn't cost them anything to technically still have me on the books. So we're hoping that when Broadway returns, we'll, we'll get to come back. We do education around the Broadway shows and talkbacks after the Broadway shows and then outreach and residencies in schools generally every spring, although clearly that won't be happening this year. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's a really great program. Are you serving Liz as a music director or coach? Well, primarily music director is, is a main focus, but essentially for that program, we'll be paired with another teaching artist and we go into a school for 17 weeks. And the goal is to teach the teachers of that school how to direct, music direct, choreograph, and stage manage. So whenever we go into a school, we each take on two of the roles. So sometimes I will direct and music direct, sometimes I'll music direct and stage manage. And then there's a, a school team member assigned to each of those four roles and we are training them. So we're there for 90 minutes a week and then they do a shadow rehearsal where they run a rehearsal for 90 minutes a week so that the entire point is teaching them rather than like, here's Disney and we come in and we put on a show with your kids and then they never have that experience again. We're trying to build sustainable arts programs. Nice. The best. Yeah. Yeah. I used to do that as a young artist. We'd go into at-risk schools and yep. do a similar thing, but we, were, we weren't teaching the teachers. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It really helps. And it's it's such an awesome program. It's grown. We've partnered with different arts organizations in cities all over the country and now internationally some. And it's been around for over 10 years now, and it's really grown and blossomed in all sorts of different areas. So I know you mostly as an actor and a musician. Really, I yeah. mean, as an actor is how I yeah. worked with you when you were a student. But you're doing a lot of different things, which everyone has to do to keep themselves sustainable. What? How did you start growing up in Seattle? Mm -hmm. Was where did you start in terms of your interest? And then how was your lifestyle in Seattle different than how you're living now? Yeah, well, I definitely had music first. Since my mother is a musician, I had, you know, piano lessons, non-negotiable from early on, which of course now I'm so grateful for. And I sang in choirs, after school ones and church ones and all sorts of stuff. But I did find theater pretty early. I went to a, a K through eight school that had a musical theater program 
for fourth through eighth graders, you could audition for the big musical. So I got excited about that pretty early on. And at 13, I was fully bitten by the bug. I I had been taken, I, it was, I must have been 11 or 12. And my parents took me to see the national tour of Susical. And I saw the kid playing Jojo in that. And I like came home sobbing. I was like bereft. I was like, that's <laughs> something you can do. Why am I not doing that? And I was so upset. <laughs> and it was, and so it kind of went from there. So I started looking for after school educational theater and Seattle's great for that. There's so many regional theaters that there's a ton of after school, you know, kindergarten through 12th grade programming. So I was from about 13 on always doing after school theater. And what's great about that is in Seattle, a lot of the programs that I would do, I do like summer conservatory theater things. And the program that I got into at 14 always had us working as teaching artists as well. So I would be in, in a program doing a show, chorus line, hilarious. And uh, <laughs> then I would also be an intern or assistant teacher working with the younger kids and the show that they were doing. So the performing and teaching artist work happened at the same time for me from really early on. And that's just continued and felt like a natural extension when I got here. And in the performance world, the musician stuff also played a huge piece because a lot of the work that I have done has been in actor musician shows, or even if they weren't actor musician shows, when they hired me, they became actor musician shows because they'd be like, oh, you can play this. Let's add this in. And I'd be like, OK, because it's fun. <laughs> you didn't do you didn't do that much of that in college. did yeah, you? Yeah, I it was I was technically musical theater. I definitely was resistant to getting boxed in as the piano player, which has been something I talk about with my students now. I was afraid that if I was seen as a piano player, I would only ever get to be a piano player. And so what mm -hmm. I missed was, in fact, that was my superpower. That was the thing that was going to get me in the door and the leverage. And what I've realized now is any actor musician things that narrows the pool so much that it's been easier to get in the door. And then every relationship I've built from an actor musician project, like I was hired by Hunter Foster for an actor musician show that I didn't know anything about a show called Buddy Holly, which is a very popular actor musician show. And when I went to that audition as a non-union human going in for a season, you know, signing up at 5 a.m. and starting my own non-equity list, it was the first time I started a non-equity list. <laughs> I saw their whole season and I was like, I don't know that I'm right for anything on this season. And it, their season was Rocky Horror and Buddy Holly. And I don't even remember what else was on it, but nothing I thought I was right for. I was like, maybe Rocky Horror. I don't know. But I just went anyway. And the role that I ultimately ended up booking was listed in the breakdown as a woman in her 40s or 50s. But the mm. casting director saw that I played piano on my resume and she asked me in the audition, hey, could you play something? And so I played something on the piano and that got me a callback and booking that show got me my EMC card. And the following summer, that show was remounted and that got me my equity card. And I've since worked with Hunter on numerous projects. He's brought me on for other shows and readings and just never would have thought that embracing the musician side of it was useful and not like something to be worried about being boxed in by. I, I want to go back for a second. You talked about the the equity, the sign up, the equity yes. sign up. So I know this very well from my young acting days that yes. there's that non-union yep. sign up. Will you, for those who don't know mm -hmm. what that is, will mm -hmm. you just briefly explain that sign up list? Of course. Absolutely. So if you are not in the union, there is no official procedure for you. So it's always called the non-official, non-union list, unofficial list. Essentially, it's by honor system, the community of non-union actors, whoever gets to an audition first on a given day, and we're talking four to six in the morning, no joke, we'll start a list. And so I had started to bring my own paper, like bring a notebook in case you're going to start a list and some scotch tape and a pen. And you'd write. Of course you would. I'm, well, but, you, you know. know. 
<laughs> uh, yes. I, I mean, I remember just like in the early 90s that yeah. there was like a piece of notebook paper. Yeah. I was like, do they do it digitally now? No, oh, it's still no, a piece so, of paper. It's still so old school. And especially because a lot of the buildings won't open until 6 a.m. So if you're right. there prior to 6 a.m., you're going to scotch tape a piece of notebook paper outside the door of Pearl or something. And then once the buildings open, the security desk will they're so understanding. They will generally let you put that piece of paper on their desk, but then the studio where the audition happens won't open until 8 a.m. So <laughs> the official procedure is once the studio is open at 8 a.m., then you can go upstairs and an hour before the audition starts. So auditions will start at either 9.30 a.m. or 10 a.m. if they're equity principal auditions or equity chorus calls. An hour prior to that, the audition monitor shows up and starts signing up the equity actors. Usually, they will allow somebody to transfer the unofficial non-union list to the official non-members list that they bring. But it's possible they have the right that they can say, no, I'm not accepting that. And then whoever is in the room at that moment signs up. But they're generally very understanding of that and will let somebody transfer the list, again, all honor system stuff, to the list that's there. Yeah, the equity sign-up is, is still paper as well. There is a little bit of both. It's a little hybrid for equity actors. For equity principal auditions, which is for any lead characters in a play or a musical, you can sign up ahead of time. And that is its own kind of madhouse where at noon the week before the audition, you have your finger hovering over the computer. You got to be signed into the member portal at today's mm -hmm. auditions. And as soon as it hits noon, you refresh. And if your internet is fast enough and you get in there, you get into a, a virtual queue to sign up and then you can pick a slot. And there are four slots per 20 minutes that you can sign up online for they still reserve two slots per 20 minutes as day of signups, meaning walk in or in that. ECC is a little bit easier. ECC, you just, um, an equity chorus call, you add yourself to the list and that number can get as high as it wants. And then on the day of the ECC, whoever has signed up ahead of time, and that's again listed the week before, they read that list in order and there's no penalty if you sign up for that and then you don't show. So you could sign up and be number 176 and then on the day show up and end up being number 68. Right. Because a bunch of those. And then you get a card and get seen in that order. So it's an adventure. Oh, it's so brutal. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. I was just talking to one of my students about this the other day that one of the most challenging things is when you are faced with the enormity of just how many people are there. It is so much harder to stay in your own confidence and yourself when you're looking at hundreds of other people who want the same thing. And so if your protection method is to say, well, why do they think they're going to get it? Then it makes it really hard for you to think, well, then why would I? You know, yeah. it makes it so much harder than if you have an appointment and you're seeing, okay, five or 10 people ahead of you or after you. It just, it takes such tough skin and, and sureness of self that's not a that's not a phrase but now it is yeah yeah it's challenging but it is it's part of the story you know it's part of the adventure it's part of i don't know if paying your dues feels like the right term either because it's not ideal it's definitely not great but it will test you if this is really what you want to do and if it's not that's okay too but knowing that that's part of it is important, knowing that like you're going to have to get through some of that. And is that worth it to you? And it is totally legitimate. If you decide as a human, it is not. There are other ways to be involved in this industry. And there are absolutely other ways yeah. that may be more satisfying totally. to you. But one of the interesting things as you think about, I mean, from my end, and we're going to talk about your students and your your coaching, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're taking a little detour and journey here. I love it. But. <laughs> Sometimes students, when they don't show up to the required uh, mandatory auditions at university, you're like, oh, you know, your competition is so much smaller. I mean, it's all relative, but you're like, if you can't leave your dorm or apartment and get yourself over 
to do this. I don't know how, but they're there. They're there to learn. So in four right. years, hopefully they'll figure that out and we'll right. teach them that. But you start to think like it's so much of a bigger thing in the big markets. In answer to your question about what's different from growing up to now, I feel like the biggest thing is when you're growing up, there's all this imposed structure, right? There's school, there's after school activities, you have to show up, you're expected to show up. Now, if you want to pursue this career, nobody is going to make you go to that audition. Nobody's going to make you take a class. Nobody's going to make you study more. The amount that you are invested and committed to furthering your career by investing in yourself and studying or by going to auditions or by meeting people, nobody's going to make you. So if you don't, you just won't. And, and that's where you'll be. And that I feel grateful that I have always been pretty self-motivated from, from early days of seeing Susical on <laughs> that tour and being like, I have to do this. And my parents were supportive, but also made it my thing. And, you know, my mother was like, yeah, you can do that, but figure it out. So I would have to look up the auditions myself and figure out, you know, what bus would I have to take for an hour and a half to get to the audition and the rehearsals so that if I wanted to do it, I had to do it. And that has definitely helped continue that process now. <laughs> yeah, that's good training for you. Yeah. So that's really awesome that your parents were that supportive. And I know that you can transfer that to the students you're teaching. I know you've recently, maybe even through this COVID situation, oh, yeah. <laughs> launched your own really intensive coaching um, program. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Well, so since all of my jobs were in the arts and they all disappeared really quick, I was sitting here and obviously missing the industry myself, but I couldn't help but think about all of the folks who maybe graduated from a program between 2018 and 2020 and either got here and just got started, just got their feet wet in the industry and then everything stopped or didn't even get here at all yet and are still sitting at home in their parents' basements wondering what in the world do I do? Like how Will there be a career on the other side of this? Is there anything I can do to move it forward? I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. And I realize I have been doing this for eight years and I spent four years auditioning as non-union and two or one as EMC. And now I've been equity for several years. And I had all this information in my brain about the business of it and things you might need to know that you could figure out over a number of years but it was just sitting in my brain, like gathering dust. And so I decided to build this course for actors who want to bridge the gap between their creative training and the craft of pursuing theater from not just the business of theater, because it does have, you know, contract negotiations and budgeting and where are the auditions and what are the procedures for various auditions. But it's also become largely about reclaiming your artistry because I found a lot of these students have come out of programs where, you know, these programs have given them their best, but as part of that, the program has to give them structure. And so the structure that they're given is lots of do's and don'ts, you know, don't ever sing a song from the show. Don't transpose songs, do wear dual tone dresses and character shoes, whatever the rules are, they come with, a little bit of trepidation of, well, but uh, what if I, that's not the rules. Well, that's not right. They said to do this. I don't want to do it wrong. I don't want to make them mad. Well, what if my eight bar cut is 10 bars? And so that is anathema to artistry. And so a big piece of this course has become strategizing not only who you are, where you fit in the industry, what kind of stories you want to tell, what kind of characters you want to play, but also how do you sell that? How do you pitch it? The idea that every audition is you pitching yourself for a role and therefore you can do that creatively and you can make a big, bold choice as long as you know why. You know, there's so much control we actually do have. And after a lot of time hearing that the competition is fierce, which it is, the odds of being successful are low, which 
they are depending on how you define success. Right. You know, but there is so much that is in our control. And I feel that not only with like the folks just coming out of school, but sometimes my own peers, there's so much we can strategize and so much we can maximize in terms of variables that a lot of people are not taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. And I think... Especially as the world changes. Yes, exactly. I mean... Into more of a digital space. Yeah, there's so many things that we can think about. And my own type A compulsion is, has made me always want to strategize that because it makes it fun for me. And that has been, it, it makes it feel like a game, feel like, you know, a bingo card of meeting new people and recognizing that every interaction I have and everything that I do is planting a seed. And what's awesome about that is I don't know what kind of flower is going to grow or when, but as long as I keep planting seeds and watering them, I know they will grow. And that makes it exciting to see what's going to happen. So this course has very much become, how do you not feel like you are the kid standing on the side of the dance, hoping to get noticed, hoping to get discovered and, and wondering why you're not, but realizing you get to control what you wear, what material you bring, how you're pitching yourself. If you want to be seen as a type of character, rather than saying, well, you know, such and such told me that I can't be that. Sure. Maybe if you hear that from everyone for years, but also one person's opinion is one person's opinion. And if you really think that you fit a particular role and you can pitch to me why, then let's figure out what's the material to sell you is that and make a strong case for it so that every time you're walking into an audition, you're like, this is what I would bring to this role and why I think I would be a good fit for it. And they can take it or leave it and see if that fits into their vision of the world. But it makes it so much more fun when you get to reclaim that artistry and ownership of your career, knowing that these things take a lot longer than you think. And so if you can make it fun and have that patience, there's a whole world of joy to bring back when you've been stuck in a right, wrong checklist. How do I do the right thing and not make anybody mad mentality? Yeah. And I, I love that you talk about, you know, once they know who they are, because I really yeah. think that when students get to a university, the first thing they have to do is figure out who they are. I think it's really important to have those beginning courses of who am I without the constraints of yes. my family dynamic right. and how I've been cast based on the kind of school I go to. Right. So it's like, who am I and what does it mean to live the life of a craftsperson, an artist, yes. and to bring yourself every day and improve in an artistic and creative field. And so most schools... Most reputable schools now have some kind of totally. business course, but yeah. sometimes they're just not there yet. And when you talk about, right. you know, they don't, having done this for 20 years, I know that I can say something three times, 10 times, and they <laughs> won't hear it from me. But yes. if I bring you in, they'll go, did you know this? And they'll repeat back right, to me like, something uh. that yeah, I've said. <laughs> but that's fine. We get the professors get that's the that's the game. But um I think now, especially when it comes to identity, so you we take them from their homes, we bring them to university, we teach them craft, they're ready to go out into the world. Now they've mm -hmm. gone back home. Yes, exactly. Most of them. Yeah. Or they've gone on to some place where they, they're taking on a job that has nothing to do with the arts, probably. Right, right. And they're all discombobulated about what's my identity and am I an artist and what does it mean to be an artist? And so right. I think you can keep them really focused on you are an artist, you've learned your craft, let's break down some things that about what it really means today, yes. like post middle pandemic today to be an artist. I love that you're doing that. Thanks. Yeah. And it's also that we keep becoming who we are. You know, it's not like we reach a point where we're like, oh, I figured it out. This is me. And so part of it is like building these processes. And this is what we've been talking about is how do we build processes so that as you continue to evolve, you can make your audition book evolve. And as your dream roles evolve or as your dream scenarios involved. Like maybe your dream is to tour right now, but five or 10 years from now, you'll be like, I really want to stay in one place. Cool. Great. Know that. 
And let's talk about how do we continue this identity as an artist and give you the processes to analyze your auditions. And are you bringing into the room what you want to be doing? Are you presenting what you want to be doing? If your goals have shifted, then your material should shift and how you're pitching yourself should shift. But that's something that we can start building these processes now so that they will serve you as you continue to evolve and grow for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And you're a longtime listener. Well, long time, you know, today. Oh, today, the day we're recording is exactly a year since Ditch Your Oh my gosh, launched. congratulations. Yeah. It's so exciting. <laughs> but you're a year long listener. And you hey. know that one of the things I'm trying to support is that you do emerge. You don't know. Yes. You really don't know. No. As someone who is a very yeah. satisfied artist and educator, not someone who feels... um that I've anyhow said, I've never settled, I've shifted and changed. And I think you have to know that things will emerge. And it, the sooner you can eliminate the guilt or the identity crisis mm -hmm. that you have when you shift, the sooner yes. you can get rid of that, the more yes. uh, fulfilled, the more fulfilled you'll feel. Yeah. And it is a hard balance because I know on the one hand, we're taught, you know, be grateful for everything and therefore you should say yes to everything. Unfortunately, I feel like that's sometimes interpreted as not having boundaries and say yes to everything, no matter what, even if it doesn't make you happy. And I think that's a fine line because on the one hand, being open to planting seeds and you never know where they're going to grow, but also listening to your own intuition and what things you want to do. I talk with my students about that there are different phases and, and starting to recognize, you know, when you start, yeah, say yes to everything and try some things and do stuff for free and see what you like and see what you don't like. And then at some point in your gut, you'll be like, this was the last time I did something for free. You know, I remember very specifically what that project was for me and knowing when your boundaries change and when your interests change, but you won't know unless you are attuned to that, attuned to your own intuition and allowing yourself to tell you. And so thinking about what your expectations of any project are before you accept any project, a big piece of contract negotiations that I talk about is First, you have to think about what is this project going to give you? You know, is it going to be soul fulfilling? Is it going to make you a bundle of money? Is it going to advance your career? And even if it's going to do none of those things, if you've just arrived and doing anything is the success, great. But then you have the expectations that are clear that like, okay, this is not going to be soul fulfilling. It won't necessarily advance my career. It's not going to make me a bunch of money, but I'm going to get some experience and I'm going to learn something. Then you're not going to be disappointed when it doesn't check all of those other boxes. And then you have some structure to be looking at things as you move forward. And at some point saying, okay, now my projects have to check at least one box. Now my projects have to check at least two boxes. And ultimately, honestly, three boxes is a unicorn project that doesn't always happen at any level of success. So if you find one, just savor it and enjoy. But two boxes is a great place to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like this pandemic time of pause has all made us examine ourselves more deeply anyway. So it is a good time to start tuning into what our needs are, what we want, and, you know, reconnecting with that 14 year old jumping up and down on the bed, singing defying gravity after a breakup, you know, like what is it? <laughs> Real life stories. Yeah. Uh, but like what made you want to do this in the first place and know that that is a pretty important guiding light and that'll shift and grow. But being true to yourself of, of why you want to be here in the first place and noticing how it evolves can help you find sustainability that's something that I feel very strongly about. I pretty early on decided I was going to have a career in the arts and I didn't know exactly what that looks like because you can't, but I know that I'm going to have a career in the arts because I'm very stubborn and I work really hard and I don't give up. And, and that is a, a broad enough scope that I feel confident I can do that. And especially since I've created jobs out of teaching artistry and, and music directing and directing and coaching and all of those things together are just different aspects of the same thing and they all feed each other. So it feels related. Did you have a backup plan? No, not at all. To me, backup plan, I mean, backup means 
failure. Like you feel like it's a failure and plan means you put effort into it. So I didn't put energy into what to do if something goes wrong. Instead, I took that energy into figuring out how do I make money? You know, because the reality is we have to figure out ways to sustain ourselves. But I got creative about what to do. And there are so many ways to do it. And they don't all have to be in the arts. You know, I have been lucky enough to primarily have my money making ventures in the arts because of piano playing and teaching experience. But I've also done some babysitting. I definitely worked at Starbucks before I left Seattle because that's, you know, they like require you to get the Starbucks stamp before you leave <laughs> Seattle, of course. Um, but yeah, it was clear to me that I would figure it out. I took a year off between high school and college, which I think also helped me really appreciate when I got to school. I didn't remember that. Yeah, yeah. And and I mean, it was kind of for a devastating reason at the time, because I went to a public high school where nobody knew about theater schools. I didn't know about the National Unified Auditions, which if you're interested in looking for colleges in theater, it's really good to know. I super didn't know that the first time I auditioned. So I auditioned for a few schools and I got into three of five, but I didn't get into the two that I really wanted to get into. And I hadn't been honest with myself about that. I thought that I'd be fine with any of them. And then when I didn't get into the big, you know, schools, I was heartbroken. And I mean, I was 17 at the time. And so I just, I was like, well, is this over? Like, is this dream over? And it <laughs> got so ridiculous to hilarious. think now. I know, exactly. But like, it felt so real because it was like, we get so caught in this. If I don't get into the school, it's such a competitive field. If I don't get into the school, how will I make it? Because I had friends who were getting into Carnegie Mellon and University of Michigan and, and I didn't. And so I was like, okay, I can give up or not. And so I decided that I was going to take a year off rather than go to a school where I could then recognize I wouldn't feel satisfied. Not that the programs were good, but I just could tell, like, I didn't think it would make me happy. I decided to take a year off and try again. And I mean, at that point, that's when I decided like, okay, I didn't let not getting into the schools that I thought I had to get into to be successful stop me. So therefore nothing will stop me. <laughs> now I had the drive and the fire to make it work no matter what. Oh, if you're handed things, you it's very hard to find that fire. Right. Well, and we've seen that. That can be a challenge. Exactly. If you get something right away, I mean, that's wonderful. But then where do you go from there? You know, I mean, I have had such a balance of getting just enough things early on to sustain thinking that I had some legitimacy. And then times I didn't, I didn't get the lead in my own high school musical in my public school, you know, and it's all, and I had just been doing professional theater in a, for a couple of years there, but it is, it will never be fair. It will never be equal. It is, it is a tough industry and you either decide that's worth it or not. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be fighting for equity and greater diversity and greater treatment of all humans. Certainly that is important, but it won't always feel fair because mm -hmm. that's just not, it is a business and that isn't how it works. Yeah. 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 But not getting into school that year. I mean, that really was like, oh, well then I'm going to figure out how to do this my own way. And that helped me know that I was going to figure out how to do it my own way, whatever that meant. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at, on this journey, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just keep, I'm, I've had a flash of you as a young student. and Oh. That, that always just makes me smile and makes me I happy. I love that. Too. I feel like I learned how to act in your show. In Big Love. I remember that. In Big Love. Yeah. What a, what mm -hmm. a joy of a show that was. Oh, like that's one that for the books. That was such an amazing show. That's one of my favorite shows I have ever done. You mm. were fantastic in it. 
You were fantastic. Everyone brought their A game. Oh. The designers, the actors. Yeah. I still so show. Cool. There's a YouTube. Um, one of the film students did a doc, yeah. kind of a documentary trailer. You remember that? I still show it to, yeah. to my directing yeah. students to show them some moments yep. that we came up with there. Boy, that oh, was a scary yeah. show to put together, though. At the beginning, remember? Developing it with wreck? viewpoints yeah. was so scary and so cool and so many weird exercises that went so many places. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was me saying I'm going to take big risks because I tell my students to. And most nights I went home like, this is not ever going to (laughs) work. And it did. It did. (laughs) It did. It was so cool. And, you know, what it made, what it clicked in for me, because I'd spent, I was a junior then. So the first two years, it was a lot of craft and the do's and the don'ts and the rules and all of those things. And it was, I think, because of like the open development of how we built that show that somehow it clicked into me. I was like, yes, all of those rules, but then I have to connect it to honesty. And I was like, oh, like nobody had said it out loud. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, now find your truth, you know, like, because you kind of have to come to that your own. And I'd seen classmates of mine come to that earlier, some later, like we all found that at different times. But that was the show where I was like, oh, now take all of that. And like bring yourself and your own honesty and and like if I were in this situation, how would I actually behave? How would I actually feel? And that's a very hard lesson for a type A personality, you know, it was. <laughs> because you're trying to get it right. But I think what exactly was, what also was beautiful about your work in that show was those th- the three women, those sisters mm. and the relationship you so three fun. Three strong women of very different types who could embrace each other and do the work together. That was really unique. Yeah. No competitiveness, at least from my Definitely. perspective, it didn't seem no, to be that way. No, no. But all of us are type A and wanted to do things right. You know, like mm-hmm. all three of us had our own brand of that. So the like letting go and letting it be messy and not being in control was hard, but great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a fun little trip down memory lane that was. (laughs) Oh, I love it. What has been your biggest risk? Well, it actually wasn't moving to New York. I've listened to the podcast and I know that's like often an answer. And at first when I was thinking about it, I was like, that was a big risk because that was scary. And I didn't know a lot of people. And uh, one of my professors senior year was... Like, if you don't go now, you'll never go. And I, because I was asking, like, should I do this? Am I good enough? Can I do it? You know, classic type A questions. Mm -hmm. He was like, if you don't do it now, it'll be just harder to do later. And so I did. But the harder one for me was similar to what you were saying about, you know, in Big Love, you were taking risks because that's what you ask your students to. So the first four years I was here, I had a regular after school teaching artist gig. I was doing an after school drama program four days a week. And I'd been doing it for four years and I was in rehearsal with them. And these kids were great. They were middle schoolers. We were putting on, I want to say the music man junior. (laughs) And I realized that I, I really missed making the choices myself. You know, I loved guiding them and asking them questions and helping them figure out, you know, who they were, what their motivation was what was going on in these characters' minds, but I missed making it myself. And I had told myself this whole time, you know, well, I'll let go of this job when I book something. But the truth of the matter is I wasn't going to auditions as my job. I wasn't going enough to actually book anything. And I even turned down a job or two because it conflicted in the early times because I was afraid. Mm -hmm. So I realized if I'm going to be asking these kids every semester to come to these auditions and be brave and put themselves out there, What kind of teacher am I if I won't do the same thing, if I'm not going to auditions because I'm scared? And also, what kind of artist am I if I am not doing the thing that I said I came here to do? So I arranged that for the next semester, I was going to teach only two days a week instead of four and let that be my transition and hope that that would you know, that leap would land me somewhere. And that was the semester where I started going regularly to 5 a.m. awake downtown signing up. And that is the semester where I did my Bucks County Playhouse season EPA non-equity list, first list I started. And that particular day turned out to be a, a unicorn audition day. Did you work with Josh Fiedler? 
I did. Yeah, I did work with Josh. Yeah, he was one of the producers on, yeah. for Bucks County. They're so lovely out there. That was the great place to start. So you say the biggest risk was after you got comfortable jumping back in to doing the thing you had committed to doing, which is acting. And, you know, it makes sense because we do need some time to adjust as humans. You know, like you have to get here. You have to get settled. You have to figure out how the subway works. You have to figure out how you're going to pay your rent. But it is easy to get like these golden handcuffs of the security of a stable job. And especially because I did like the job, you know, like it it wasn't completely separate. It was in the arts. It was teaching. And I, I do love doing that. But I realized that I always wish to be doing both. I want to be doing both. The reason to be in New York City is because you have access to all of those auditions and all of those shows and all of that work. If you're not auditioning, okay, totally fine. Own it. Like if you like, because I feel like it's just going to create your own cognitive dissonance to say you're doing something, but not really be doing it. And then like, where is that like shame and guilt lurking inside of you as opposed to saying like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I love being in New York. I love working with this community. I don't love auditioning. And sometimes that's the truth. And that's okay. Often that's the truth. Yeah. I mean, it is a weird, it is such a weird way that we get jobs and it's so different. You know, a lot of schools will have like some auditioning classes, but it is all of what you're doing when you're here. Like getting the job is the cherry on top. And then all of the work that you've done in school applies then. But most of the job is auditioning. Mm -hmm. And that is a completely different skill set, which is kind of crazy. But it's true. So Liz, what have been some of the unexpected rewards you've gotten in your career? that your younger self would just find unbelievable. I've done a bunch of productions of once. I did four different regional productions, which added up to a lot of performances. But I still have now done more performances of this show called The Other Josh Cohen, which ran off Broadway for about six months. And it was just a parade of every industry professional that I had read about, seen, or heard on an uh, original cast recording. It was just incredible. And it really taught me about like the mindset of, of how long-term this process is. Because I asked one of the other actors, I was like, how is it that like all of these people are coming to support your show and see you and staying afterwards to say hi? And they were like, well, we've been around for 20 years. So yeah, we know everybody. But I got the benefit of that, of oh, cool, Sondheim just saw me perform. And I I was the understudy for Kate Weatherhead, who um, a lot of people know her from her amazing, amazing web series called Submissions Only, which I highly recommend. It's so fun. And she's just the loveliest human. And I was her understudy and I got to go on for one performance. And it was the performance that Neil Patrick Harris came to. Mm -hmm. which was very cool. And I found out five minutes before I was going on that he was in the audience, which is very exciting. They were trying to not tell me, but uh, somebody somebody mentioned it and uh, and they were like, no, we're just kidding. And I was like, oh, no, you're not. You just don't want to make me nervous. Okay, I'm fine. I'll be good. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Ugh. I was more nervous when I found out Sutton was in the audience by like seeing her. Too late. <laughs> but yeah, it was a parade of all the fancy people that I had heard of and seen. And we had the big opening night party with a step and repeat. And then I don't even remember the term they use, but it's where, you know, this was not just like a step and repeat where you can take pictures of yourself. It was Playbill photographers and Broadway world. And, and there was like a schedule and they were like, okay, we're going to do the group shot that we're going to do. I don't know if they called it singles. I don't even yeah. remember the term for everybody's individual shots. And I was like, not until this moment have I considered what technique one uses for these things. And so I was really grateful. Mm -hmm. The other two women who had a lot more experience than I did went first. And I was like, okay, they keep moving. <laughs> the smiles are mostly mouth closed, but I couldn't do that because my big goofy smile is like, so in the pictures, you know, I'm like a big toothy grin and, and they look very like chill and professional, but I was like, this is right. And I was like, it had not occurred to me that it would be here, that this was something we were doing. Nobody had mentioned it to me. And why would they? And I was like, yeah, fake it till you make it for the win. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally know what I'm doing. Yes. I'm going to keep moving. And, uh, you know, uh, yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just the craziest, but just, you know, getting to chat with, 
Billy Crudup at the sh- at the opening night party and Richard Kind and all these folks who had just seen me perform when I've spent all of my years growing up watching them. That was definitely a lot of feeling like I made it moments, you know, just taking all of those in just incredible. How, how are we here? And let's savor this and remember forever. So Liz, have you made it? I have made it to new levels all the time. That's the way I think about it because there are so many things that are doors that I've gone through that opened up new levels of opportunity. And I've made a point to really notice them and celebrate them because it's so easy to compare up only to be like, well, I haven't been on Broadway yet. I don't have a Tony award, blah, blah, blah. And it's so easy to forget, but I do have an equity card and I have an agent and I, you know, I've had Broadway auditions and I've had a Broadway final callback and I have gotten to work with actors and directors that I imagined and read about when I was growing up. So that's how I think about it. Mm -hmm. And that way it's always a process of there's always more ways to make it. There's always new levels and there's all these successes that I can celebrate and savor from what I've done already. It's so important to to celebrate those moments for sure. I yeah. think, you know, when you're in the grind, you forget to do that. So on that yeah. point of seeing people that you you imagined when you were younger, you knew, I won't say idolized, yeah. but people that you admired when you were younger, mm-hmm. who did you have to see to know that you could be who you are today? Well, I mean, from an artistic standpoint, early on, at an audition, someone said, oh, you remind me so much of Sutton Foster. And so I looked her up because it was like very, very early days. And so I have always really looked up to her career in that she plays such a wide range of characters. And I found that so fun. You know, everything from Millie to Shrek to Little Women to Violet to Baker's Wife. I loved that she played such a range of roles and brought such honesty and vulnerability to it and have always aspired to do a lot of the roles that she does, all the ones that don't require a lot of dancing, you know? (laughs) So artistically, that's definitely a person's career that I have watched. And I have since gotten to meet her and we've taken a picture together and she commented on it that, oh my gosh, twins, I told her. She was like, the only person that I've met and was truly starstruck about. And she was so (laughs) kind and so, and of course I worked with her brother now a ton, but I've now gotten to meet her a couple of times. And, and that still, that still like makes my heart flutter just because it takes you back to just the very beginning. Yeah. But in terms of how I work, I think I learned the importance of the experiences and the savoring the process and the, where there's a will, there's a way from my mother. Mm -hmm. without a doubt, because she showed me so early on that you make it work. I I had an opportunity to do a Broadway callback when I was 16, 17, like really early days. I was invited from a video to come to New York for a callback for Spring Awakening when they were looking for a cover for Vendla. Mm -hmm. And it was insane because it was I want to say a Tuesday and they were like, can you be here Friday? And I was, uh, I was in a professional show. I was in high school and we had to get me out of all of those things. And my mother dropped everything and like bought flights so that we could do there. And then there was a crazy thunderstorm on the East coast. So our flights were canceled. And the earliest thing we could get out was the next morning out of Portland And she dropped everything, bought us new flights, not having gotten refunded on the other ones. And we drove from the airport in Seattle to Portland, where her uh, sister and brother-in-law live. And we spent the night, aka slept for a few hours before we then got up and went to the airport in Portland and flew to New York, got permission to miss the initial audition, which ended me up at, I want to say the final callbacks. It was basically a work session, which I definitely didn't know what that was, but I got to that audition and 
just the number of strings that she pulled and the tenacity at any point in that process, she could have given up and been like, this is just it's not going to work. This is too much. It's too expensive. It's too crazy. But she valued that experience and she recognized how special that was. And I definitely didn't book it. I didn't even do that well. You know, I was right after the girl who did book that job because that was <laughs> I, literally I was I was right after Alexandra Soka, who then took over for Leah Michelle as the Vendla cover. And she did her audition and she was so kind to me. And uh, I also I didn't even know New York. This was my first time coming to New York for an audition, I didn't know about streets versus avenues. So I told the cab 528th street, which is definitely not the same as 528th Avenue. No. So I was late and I was running up to get there and I was like, where do I sign in? And, and this girl, Alexandra, um, told me and was so kind. And then she went in and she crushed it and they were all coming out and like, Oh, great job. And shaking your hand. And I was like, Oh boy. <laughs> and then I went in and there were like 12 people in there. It was the producers and the directors. And I, I mean, I was so in over my head and I did get some feedback later, which was very kind. The music director knew like a high school teacher of mine and was like, she was doing such a great job of trying to pretend she wasn't nervous. <laughs> I was like, that's right. That's right. Uh, but it was so sweet. And the fact that, you know, the odds of me getting that were like so bonkers banana. I was so not ready, but my mother knew how important it was to make it happen. And she did. I, and then on, because our flights were canceled, our flights back were also canceled. And so she rebooked her flight. She was able to stay on and go back that day. We had to rebook a new flight for me the following day. So I spent the night in New York City alone. At what age? I went 17. Yeah. Uh, we got connected to an actor um, who I have recently reconnected with. She's now organizing a theater conference that I'm going to be presenting my course to. And she emailed me and was like, hey, I heard about your course. We think it'd be a great fit. Would you like to be in the virtual resource room? I was like, yes. Also, you wouldn't remember this, but 15 years ago, you let me sleep on your couch. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So it turned out great. That night I stayed in town and I saw a company by myself, the John Doyle revival. And uh, the next morning I flew back and I had gotten permission to miss a couple of performances of the show I was in. I was in a production of the Who's Tommy directed by Brian Yorkie, who has since written Next to Normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to get driven directly from the airport to the theater. And then I did two shows that day. What a gift from your mom, though. Because oh my gosh, if, I'll never if, forget it. If you hadn't been bitten by the bug and if that wasn't the right mm -hmm. thing for you, you would have given up right then and there. Yeah. And I, my mom did something similar for me when I was probably yeah. 15. Um, a, yep. a different kind of thing, more about TV and commercial work. Yeah. I, I mean, I had no idea yeah. what I was getting into. Of course. But I think she was like, you need to understand what this is that you think you want to do. Yeah. And that inspired me more. Yeah, for sure. And it was just, I, I mean, it's the greatest gift I, I ever could have been given. And I will never forget it. Oh, thanks, mom. Thanks, mom. I know. She's the best. <laughs> thanks all moms who support artists, for sure. And keep doing it. Yeah. If a student out there wants to take your course and they think that that's a right fit for them, that they'd like to continue their yeah. journey, especially while they're sitting, as we say, in parents' basements going, how am I ever going to stay on top of everything and learn how to do this when everything comes back? Yeah. How can they find out about your course? Well, I have uh, a lot of information about it through Instagram and I have just joined the TikTok revolution as well. So that's an early days thing. But the link in my bio on Instagram goes to all the info about the course. And I am actively enrolling right now for rounds two and three, which start March 1st and June 1st, respectively. Of 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And your Instagram handle is? It is at Elizabeth Nestle Road, just my full name. Elizabeth with a Z and Nestle Road is spelled like Nestle chocolate and then R-O-D-E. And then you just link in your bio and that goes to all the information about the course. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And you can DM me, you know, reach out with questions. Good, good. Absolutely. I love chatting with people about this stuff. That's awesome. Is there any last anything you want to share before we sort of sign off? Oh, gosh. Anything you're reading, listening to, watching? I've been doing a lot of reading. I haven't watched a ton. I've been reading... So many different books over the course of this year. Some of my favorites 
I loved, I know it's not current, but Becoming yeah. by Michelle Obama, just incredible, you know, Untamed by Glennon Doyle, a lot of personal growth books, mm-hmm. You Were a Badass by Jen Sincero, yep. um, have all been great. I've been enjoying podcasts, obviously this one, I'm all loving all these episodes and I've gotten to recommend them in my recommended books and podcasts for the course, which has been such a blast. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. And uh, Armchair Experts, another one that I really enjoy. It just, you know, all those conversations of us being vulnerable and talking about where we're at and such. Um, Working in the Wings is another great podcast for technical theater. It's interviews uh, a friend of mine created then they interview folks in all the backstage jobs specifically. Mm, good. Oh, I should get them on here. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, 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 I'll connect you. I'll connect you with them. I wish you all the best. Say hello to all of your beta group of students from me. And Thank you, I will. I hope that all goes well for you and that you're back performing because you're so good at it, that you're back doing that very soon. Ah. Uh. That will be fun. I look forward. I mean, I think we're all going to get back into the audition room and just be like tears of joy. So grateful. Oh, the first time we see a show, uh, just tears the whole time. Oh my gosh. It's like hard to even think about. The first time we're in a group of people and can hug someone, Mm -hmm. you know, any of it. It's going to be wonderful. I can't wait. I hope we hang on to it and don't like have three months where we're grateful and then we start complaining again. (laughs) But, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. I know you will impact a lot of young lives and maybe not so young lives. Hey, thanks, Jen. I'm Jen Valenga, and you've been listening to the Ditch Your Backup Plan podcast. Next week features Damian Taylor. He's a co-founder of Prometheus Digital Studio in California, and he's the creator of the Tech Witch podcast. Make sure you join the community group over at Facebook, Fearless Friends, the DYBP podcast. Thanks for listening.